Hello, I'm Mark Baer. Welcome to Conversations and Collaborations. Uh, I'm with my great friend, Thomas Hood, architect, designer. We've had this ongoing relationship conversation for many years now, and uh, I guess you at home get to join us. So to start, uh, when we were going to have this talk, I, uh, you know, we said, what are we going to talk about? And I said, let's, let's uh, look at this book about Philippe Stark, uh, the French designer, uh, as, as, a, as a starting point, just because um, I like everything about him, and you like everything about him. And this is kind of, uh, in the world of art, design, architecture, creativity, we uh, want to aspire, and we have certain... I don't know, romances in our our mind about who we're, in our fantasy life, what kind of lifestyle we'd be living or who we'd be or who we'd be designing for or, you know, what those ideals are. And if there's an ideal to design for me, uh, not only in the elegance of what Philippe Stark does, but in the attitude, you know, the fun, the, uh, just the, the, uh, unpretentiousness of it. To me, what, what comes to mind fundamentally is some of the statements that he's made about uh, what is just beautiful isn't necessarily what designers need to provide, is to be part of the, the larger cosmos and part of the community or part of the world. Uh, a much bigger idea when you think about picking up a toothbrush in the morning. Uh, but, but fundamentally, what, what he's basically saying that, that I take from his work is if you just merely emulate or duplicate something that's already been done, don't pick up that pencil. You, know, you don't need to start that conversation. But if, you've got, if you have the will, the talent, and the courage to try something different for the better mousetrap or the better toaster or the better restaurant, then go ahead and take that leap. Ultimately, that can benefit more and bring more back to the world than if you're merely emulating. Now, if you take that same sort of conversation and bring it into architecture, and my practice is, is has largely been fundamentally uh, representational work, meaning I'm doing exactly what he says people shouldn't do. <laughs> and I make a very good living doing it. But his, uh, they're, they're, the similarities between what I'm doing and what he's doing is, I would say it's in its simplest sense, is never stop, is, is be relentless in the pursuit of the truth as you're seeing it, and that truth for him has become really a global brand, which is remarkable. Uh, in my world, the truth is honesty and expression of materials fundamentally as an architect. Uh, but uh, in, an, in a, a sidestep from that is uh, fundamentally responding to the client's desires, emotions, needs, tastes, and hopefully making their lives a little bit special in a very simple, I want to say elegant way, meaning truthful way. Uh, I remember when I was in, in college and working in graduate school, I was in this office outside of Chicago, and I worked for several firms there. That's where I got all my formal training. And one summer job, I was working for a firm out in the Burbs, which is, you know, that's hell to Chicago architects, but that's where the work was. And I remember going downstairs in this two-story building, the lower floor, and that's where the senior architects were, the designers that had been with the firm going back to the late 50s, early 60s. And they were seasoned architects that knew construction, knew materials and everything. And I looked over at their board, and they've got corduroy jackets on with patches on them. And they have the pipe rack with the, the Meerschaum pipe sitting there, and a little smoke kind of drifting up, and uh, bent over the board, and happy as clams, stressless. For a couple of reasons. One is they were experienced, they knew what they were doing. Two, they didn't have to run the firm. And three, they were told, do what you love. And I left that experience saying, the last thing I want to do is be an architect living in the suburbs, wearing the corduroy jacket with the patches on it and have a collection of pipes, is I'm going to go out and change the world, which is what we are all sort of indoctrinated with in graduate school, right? And Stanley Tigerman and Robert Stern, who I studied with, said that. But the reality is, is that not everybody gets to that level that Philippe has. And he occupies a unique position and for me as an architect, he should give every architect courage, just like Frank Lloyd Wright did. And I think it was Robert Stern that may have said that years ago. He gives every architect courage. 
And Philippe is one of those people, I believe, that has been able to transcend one discipline in architecture, carry it into industrial design, not in the shadow of Raymond Lowy, but moving it forward from just the beautiful. And then with everything else he's done, he thinks really big, even if it's something only this long. And that's, to me, what makes him a very powerful design figure that I find very inspiring. Now, talking about uh, yourself, one of the things that we both love about Stark is uh, there's lifestyle, his, his lifestyle that's emblematic in everything he does, and there's a glamour in what he does. Uh, and it's a life, you know, you, you see pictures of him in his house in Paris, you see pictures of him in uh, Ibiza or Formentera, uh, and you know, just in his cut-off jeans, barefooted, doing his thing, uh, and it's very... When he was working on the motorcycle, yeah. sitting there stripped to the waist with a sketch pad on the beach. Yeah, it's very... It, it, you don't see anybody else, you know, as as real or, or a, a life that we'd like to emulate. And one of the things that... Um, we're going to get to how busy you are right now, but where we live, um, you, you know, in... Uh, the Carmel, Big Sur, Pebble Beach area, uh, selling a part of what you're selling in the houses you're designing in this area is is a lifestyle, and trying to um, you know, and one of the things that they're buying from you is more than bricks and mortar, but they're buying uh, they're buying a lifestyle from you. Your house they're, reflects they're an area. Basically, they're engaging in what I hope would be a reflection reflection of themselves. Yeah, in, in, uh, and so, uh, and when they, you know, and part of what, uh, you know, they want to, when they, when they engage with you, they want to be having as much fun as you're having. And part of your job is to, you know. Sometimes more. To, yeah, sometimes more. <laughs> well, they don't know. They don't see the sweat. <laughs> <laughs> they just see the product. But that uh, sense of place, sense of, uh, of, uh, of how it, how you really want to live and not how you, uh, you know, the fantasy of how, uh, you know, in, in a house, you know, the most important thing is how you really live, designing a house about how you really live mm -hmm. and not how the fantasy of you house, how other people are going to think you're living in your house, you know, with all that ceremonial space and all that stuff that you'll, you know, I've seen people build houses and they're never going to use this stuff, but you see that they're, they're have the sense of themselves that's not how they actually are. And one of the things that you do in your work is you, you strip it down and, you make people kind of be honest about how they really are. Well, it, it, the designing houses is, it's tougher than any other building that I've, I've been asked to work on. And when I first started my career, 40-something um, years ago as a kid, uh, my earliest inspiration were houses. And the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, new high rises, the skyscrapers in Chicago. So I was immediately attracted to the detail and the smallness and the immediacy of houses growing up in a household where my dad fixed them up. So from the age of four, my earliest recollection that applies still directly to my architectural work was walking through uh, Winnetka Colden Lumber and looking up the barn shape up above. Looks like a church. It feels like a barn. It looks like a house and the smell of the sawdust and the birds flapping around up above and the fresh cut lumber and seeing my dad pull the lumber off the rack, take it home, pull out a saw and build something right there, right? And the immediacy of that task of the end user directly participating to me is what is really historically keeps pulling me back to what I say is the most difficult building to do, which is a really good house. Every nickel counts, every square foot counts. Uh, and I'm talking about projects within a context of these aren't McMansions, these are, are, I'm going to call them functioning houses. We're not just building superfluous space or adding unnecessary detail or gigaws to make some public statement. The other side of it, from the Chicago tradition of, of looking at the work of like people like uh, Burnham and Root and William LeBrun and Jenny, and my very first job as a punk draftsman was in one of the iconic buildings in Chicago, which was the Monadnock. At its time, at one point, it was the tallest masonry, it is still, I believe, the tallest masonry structure in the world. And I was perched on the 16th floor at the end of the building and looked south to where the real heart of Chicago was with respect to all those fabulous mansions and homes. 
Now it's within a context of all these other buildings, but I was always pulled between wanting to work on the big ones and walking to work on the small ones at the time. So my experience really has sort of been both, and I've been fortunate enough to have uh, been asked to participate or design in buildings in seven states and in seven counties in California and uh, outside, of our, outside of our borders, most often dealing with the small and the immediate. And I think it still comes back to when my dad first hand me a saw. And using a, using a handsaw and using a pencil, there's a lot correlated between those two. And having worked with the tools in the past, I still draw that back. You know, we'll use technology to create documents for bidding and construction. But that initial spark of, you know, holding the pencil in your hand and putting a line down in paper is to me the most exciting moment, which you can do on a high rise. I just happen to be doing it with houses. As far as practicing in this area, I guess it still ties back to Chicago, where someone famous at one point said, building in Chicago is an act of will. You know, it's on top of the old swamp, it's dead nuts flat, and you're going to build higher, right? Because the concentration of energy and early marketing and elevators and electricity, it all happened right at that moment. Leaving Chicago I was hard to do because I said, I want to be a Chicago architect. So I practiced there long enough and actually ran a firm there that I could say I could call myself a Chicago architect, which I still do. Moving to the West Coast, that's the great escape you know, from the 19th century migration to people today. They come to reinvent, they come to escape, they come to be creative. And Carmel and the Monterey Peninsula is where people, again, one of those places where they remake themselves in often a very romantic way. They lived here, they left, they came back, or they come here to make that shift from the high rises to, in some cases, storybook cottages or uh, Tuscan inspire this, right? So the, the represent, representational work on the peninsula is the bulk of the work. There are some very good modern buildings. I just don't happen to be one of the architects that's gotten one of those built yet. Those are still on the shelf. So the dialogue between the site and the owner and I, it carries with it um, their aspirations about escape and fantasy, uh, humor, and that's what influenced a lot of these buildings here. I'm Mark Baer. You're watching Conversations Collaborations. I'm with architect Thomas Hood. We will be right back. You are watching Conversations and Collaborations. For all episodes, go to markdavidbear.com. I'm Mark Baer. You're watching Conversations and Collaborations. I'm with Thomas Hood, architect and my great friend. So one of the conversations that, that we've been having is just about uh, energy. I'm always jealous if you're working really hard. I always want to make sure that I'm working as hard as you are. And you've been really cranking uh, in, in these last couple of years. And you've had your head down and suddenly, you know, as we, had, as we spoke last week, you suddenly looked up and you have like seven, or I, I'm not even sure the number, but how many buildings under construction right now. And it just, uh, just the intensity of the work and the, the necessary the necessity of intensity to, uh, you know, imagine if you were doing this slow, how much harder it would be. What has that experience been like the last couple of years? Uh, it's, been, it's been really exciting. Uh, what, what I find sort of uh, fascinating about it in one aspect is uh, the length of time that I've been fortunate enough to be in this business and stick it out, right? A lot of the guys I work with in Chicago and Atlanta, they took a different path. They went into management, they went into development, they went everywhere. So the percentage of, of guys my age that are still doing this and actually running, I'm going to call it traditional practice, a small firm practice, it used to be more than 70% of the firms in the country were four people or less. I don't know what the, the dynamic is now, but with this last surge of work directly related to improving economic conditions, uh, coming out of yet another recession, and I think I've been in either five or six of them, is every time you come out, uh, you're a little more shop-worn, but you're sharper. Uh, sharper in terms of paying attention more. Charles Moore said 90% of architecture is paying attention. And you can apply that to however you want. The site, the client, the budget, the time, how much money you're making, how much staff you have, how, whatever metrics you've got. 
And to me, paying attention the last two years has been really focusing on listening more to the client, paying more attention to the site, and dealing with those things that traditionally are not nearly as fun in the process, getting the entitlements, uh, reinforcing systems within the office to free up that part which keeps me in the business, which is the direct client contact, the conceptual, the schematic design, the creative part. That's a very small portion of anyone's week. But what I've been really striving to do in the last two years is not get as many projects as possible because I want to stay tiny. Uh, I don't want to grow a big firm. I've gone up, gone down several times. But to focus on each individual project, give it my absolute best shot and do it quickly enough that I maintain not only my own attention span for the project, but the clients, and be very respectful of their time and budget constraints, because these markets sort of come and go. And they're, they're, you're doing very bespoke work, I would say. Well, it's, it, comes, it comes with a lot of practice, but it also comes with, you've got to grab that if your 10% of your work week is in design, is make it the most important 10% when you're in that moment, to be totally focused on that. At the same time, have music play in the background, be constantly reading, uh, keeping your ears open, and really not only not only serving just the needs of your client, but you gotta be able to serve yourself. And I think what I'm, I've, I've come to realize is I'm doing more, more of the work to feed me, which in turn gives me the energy to give my best to the clients. And I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, contractor calls up with a technical question, you know, what, is, what are the dimensions of these corbels? Well, I've been asked to design a, uh, an Andalusian-inspired house that's under construction up in, the, up in the hills, which I've never done before. So I've been poring over books, looking at the photographs I have from Spain, and not try to make it a one-off, but carry some of that flavor which the owner really, really wants. That's his escape, is to have a little bit of that. But do it in an honest way, but work with good proportions and right materials. So the contractor says, well, how big of the diameter do you want on the top of that corbel? Well, that's a 20-minute answer, a 10-minute answer, just to give him a little scale drawing. I'm going, okay, he got what he needed out of it. What do I want to get more out of these details? And what does the owner get other than answer a question? So I took about 15, 20 minutes and started to render the top of this column capital. And I said, well, as long as I'm at it, I'll draw in some of the clay roof tiles so he re the owner gets an idea what it's really going to look like. So now I've taken an answer to a question and I've turned it into a beautiful little drawing. That inspires the owner, it excites him, but it feeds me too because I've got that need to take the pencil or the felt tip or the French pastel and get that expression out. I need that. Well, you have the artist that. heart. So I've got the artist heart. And at the end of the so day, I'm doing three things at the at end once. of the day you'd be You'd be doing this for nothing if you're coming on the beach. You'd still be doing this. I have. This. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's and and that's what you know. That's kind of what this conversation is about. What is that urge? What is that drive? What is that thing? Because I see how excited you get watching you do a house, and it's not because you're getting done. I mean, you've got all the real world stuff no. going on, but you're seeing something develop in front of your eyes, and you're always well, excited about it. It's a you know, it's and you don't a, repeat yourself a lot. No, it's it's not so much a selfish motivation, though I'm getting I'm getting a big kick out of it when I'm lucky enough to be asked to design. Whether it's one room, which in our portfolio it's one of my favorite projects, my favorite 300 square feet in the last 25 years was one room, which was wonderful, um, or asked to to lay out something larger, whether it's a office interiors. Uh, or a single-family home or the hospitality work. The focus in the last couple of years has primarily been residential, single-family, residential, end-user right on the spot. And the, there, it can be infectious if, if, uh, if, if, you, if you go to a restaurant or you, you meet an, you've been reading about an author and you want to really, you want to meet that person and you want to get just a little taste of that. I mean, how many times have we ever... Uh, had the opportunity to meet either a famous musician or an actor, and we walk away disappointed because they've projected something about themselves or about the world, and you want just a little bit more out of it, right? And they're conveying, conveying enthusiasm back to you as to what you do can be very inspiring. And what I find is, 
if I get excited about the project, I can help convey that to the client. Now he's excited about the process. And so if we're sitting in a meeting and I've got my trusty black notebook, which I burn through about three of these a year, and he's talking and I say, do you mind if I take notes? And I just start to sketch while I'm watching him, right? And after about five minutes that I'm, I'm looking at this, I'll get more out of that sketch than I will out of taking a picture or writing it down. And then there's a communicative tool back to him if I turn the thing around saying, were you thinking about something like this? He gets picked up in that excitement and now he gets drawn into that sketch and I got him. And, and, and I have his attention. And then he's part of your creative process. And, and then he becomes part of the process because it's his building. He's the patron, right? Unlike, unlike a lot of other arts, a poet doesn't need a client. He can create that piece. But he wants, he wants someone else to read it, to hear it. A lot of poets do, right? The same thing with writing a song. You can, you can write a Grammy Award-winning song and never record it, and it can be in your head. And you don't need a patron. Architects need patrons. They have to have somebody there if you actually want to be a built architect as opposed to a theorist. Yeah. and actually get something done. And coming from that childhood memory of picking up the skill saw for the first time, I really want to see it built. So I'll go to the end of the earth and back to bring together all the forces of time, budget, site constraints to those projects that go over that line from something on paper to actually build. From a purely economic standpoint, what is actually very gratifying, and I realized this many years ago, is every project I can get across the line for a client creates 40 to 70, 80 jobs. That's not a bad thing. More buildings, more work, more jobs, more vitality in the economy that in turn comes back and can be used for something good. So let's talk about materials a little bit, and specifically, I want to talk about glass and, and your work on the Butterfly House. Having been designed by a, a local architect in what, early 1950s, constructed in 52, the house itself really was a, a site-specific adaptation. This, of is on, really, this is on Carmel Point. Carmel Point. Yes. So you've, you've got this house that it literally is perched on the rocks, what is it, about 11 to 15 feet above sea level, depending on the tide and whether there's a storm or not. And really using a a very modernist approach of, of a cube, of a, of a four square plan with a courtyard, but then making it site specific, taking sort of a Miesian model of universal space that can sit anywhere. He took that idea, placed it on the uphill part of the site, but then he had to connect that modernist idea to something much more site specific, which in a lot of ways is, can be considered by some architects more radian, more site specific. So the, the flourish, the moment in that building is where the building transforms from being a one-story one rectangular plan to the big room, the big moment, which is the butterfly, which is basically a hyperbolic paraboloid, abstracted, that rises up not unlike the waves or the birds flying by. And the back of that building essentially is a window wall facing right out towards Point Lobos, now to, towards the southwest. I was very fortunate to have been asked to develop a scheme working with the builder to restore that back wall. So we were looking at uh, a building of historical significance where we had to follow the Secretary of Interior's guidelines for maintaining the historic resource, restoring it and developing a plan for its, its, uh, you know, its perpetual care. At the same time, we had to deal with structural constraints of the roof up above, uh, the ocean coming in, those forces of wind and water, uh, and 50-year-old columns that it actually had warped either through initial fabrication or from storms or both. And we had to put this thing whole together in the midst of last summer and last winter. So the process really was a matter of true design-build collaboration, which is a very, in some ways, a very sort of traditional concept, right? The architect is supervisor. Well, when I was asked to do the project, the manager dropped my contract on the conference table and said, this is your project, you're running it, and he walked out of the room, and there I was sitting there looking at the rest of the team members, and it was sink or swim. So the plan really was a collaborative effort to bring in the technology of wood windows, old structural steel restoration, concrete stem walls, 
uh, historic preservation, and technology, where we're looking at a new product that actually was inter introducing a new glass product that's come out on the market recently that can be adjusted in different levels of tinting to respond to this unbearable glare and heat gain that the owners experienced. When the sun was right in that living room before the building was restored, they couldn't sit in the living room without sunglasses and with clothes on. It was just unbearable. That's one of the side effects of the sort of the purely modernist approaches. I'm not worrying about the site. All I care about is a statement. But this architect was really trying to do both. So we had to sort of channel what his intent was and adapt the, the, the design that's faithful to the exterior but brings in this glass product where you can control it by the sun orientation, by the, uh, uh, the time of year or the time of day so that you can go from clear glass in the morning to a light, to a medium, to a darker tint, depending on the orientation of the sun. And it didn't, that particular product has been growing in presence in the, in the wider commercial market, but it had never been done before of that extent on a single family residence, wood windows, restoration, 11 feet above the ocean. And you didn't know if it was gonna work until, they, <laughs> until the day of the, so tell me about the day when they're gonna put it in. It was, it, there, were, there were a couple of really wonderful moments the one that sort of carried all the way through is every step of the way working with full scale details is coming upon a question and immediately going to the master craftsman on site to say, can you get the angle of your drill in to hold this window wall in place? And without getting too much into the weeds about it, that continual interaction between structure engineer, steel fabricator, contractor, carpenter, waterproofing consultant, me, the building department, there was that moment like, the windows are in fabrication. We hope we got this right. And we're talking about windows because of the curve of these columns aren't even perfectly square. We were sizing these windows to the 16th of an inch so that when you looked at through this glass room when you're done, the slight curvature of these columns was echoed by slight changes in the orthogonal nature of each window unit so they appear straight. So that moment where we approved the fourth pass on the shop drawings was elation and total fear. When the windows arrived, my first call was to the craftsman and say, how do they look? And I got the response back, where were you? We've already got two of them in. And that was by 10 o'clock in the morning. And I went over that night and asked, uh, as one of the guys over there, uh, Butch Fisher was, was, was the lead guy, and a Keith Lamb was there, and Keith, was like the problem solver inventor. We had to figure a way to raise these windows up and insert them in this existing context of, of columns. And he devised something that's like right out of Rube Goldberg that was like a lift, that lift him up in place so you didn't have to have five guys lifting up this 480 pound window. So we figured a way to lift them up and slide them in the place. And I went to Keith, I said, so how are these windows fabricated, is it working? And he just said, I haven't seen a window this tight in 30 years. Wow. I'm Mark Baer. You're watching Conversations and Collaborations. I'm with Thomas Hood, architect, and we will be back. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Conversations and Collaborations. For all episodes, go to markdavidbear.com. See it now. Don't wait. Mm -hmm.